Hello and welcome. My name is Keith Barker. And over the past, I don't know, four or five months, I've been creating many different courses regarding Fortinet gear over at CBT Nugget. So I want to take just a few minutes in this video to walk you through the setup from zero all the way to functioning network with trunking, VLANs, wireless, and everything else using Fortinet gear. And let's take a moment and draw out the picture of what we hope to accomplish after the configuration is done. So we'll have a FortiGate. That's the firewall from Fortinet. I'll label that here as FW-40, because that's what we're going to name it. And if you happen to be brand new to Fortinet gear, let me also go ahead and spell out the title for this, which is the FortiGate. That is our next generation firewall product right there. And we are going to connect that to the internet. So I'll represent the internet right here. And for fault tolerance, let's go in through a couple different service providers. We'll call this guy Service Provider A right here, and this one Service Provider B. And that way we can also leverage SD-WAN as part of this. So we'll have two interfaces on the Fortinet that go out to our respective service providers. And for those interfaces, we'll use WAN1 and WAN2, respectively. And regarding this, FortiGate is a Model 60F, and it is running the current version of the firmware as of this recording. And let's also add some Layer 2 switches to the mix. We'll add a couple of them here in the switch stack. So we'll call this guy Switch 1, and we'll call the second one Switch 2. And for the connectivity between the FortiGate and the switches, we're going to go ahead and use what in the Fortinet world is called FortiLink. With two physical interfaces, and on this FortiGate, they're labeled A and B, which are connected over to two ports over here on Switch 1. And when this is implemented, this will be a link aggregation group with 802.1Q tunneling and these two physical interfaces working together. In a Cisco world, that would be considered a Layer 2 Ether channel. And then for the connectivity between these two switches, I'm going to go ahead and use a couple fiber ports on each of the switches. And that also is going to be a link aggregation group using 802.1Q trunking once we have it complete and in place. Let's also carve out a few VLANs. Let's create a VLAN 10 with the IP addressing space of 10.10.0.0 that we can use on the switch stack. And let's also create a second one for a different group of users. And let's go ahead and call that VLAN 20. And we'll use the IP addressing space of 10.20 for that with the 24-bit mask for both. And while we're at it, let's create a VLAN that we can use to support and work with our access points for our wireless network. So we'll use VLAN 5 for that with the IP address space of 10.5.0.0. And let's imagine we're going to use these two ports right here in VLAN 5. And there we can plug in a couple of access points. In the world of Fortinet, they refer to their access points as 40 APs. So I'll go ahead and label these as 40 APs. So we have the 40 gate for the firewall, the 40 AP for the access point, and these switches are referred to as a Forta switch. So let me label that as well. And let me go ahead and draw some wired connectivity from the 40 APs down to the ports that are going to be supporting the 40 APs, which are in VLAN 5. And then I'll go ahead and put a few ports here on switch 1 into VLAN 10. And I'll put a few other ports here on switch 2 in VLAN 20. So that way, if we plug in devices directly into these ports that are blue, they'll be in VLAN 10. If we plug in other devices into these ports up here that are pink, they'll be in VLAN 20. And once we have the access points in place, we can also create a Wi-Fi network. So let's do that as well. We create a Wi-Fi network. And for that Wi-Fi network, let's go and use the IP addressing space of 10.30.0.0. So my friend, to get this all up and working and to give you a full picture of all the pieces involved, here's what you and I get to do. Let's start off by doing a reset of all the gear. So we'll do a factory reset of every component you see here, the 40 APs, the switches, and also the 40 gate. And that way, you and I get to go through together every piece of configuration that we're going to do to get it up and running and fully functional. Now, as part of the factory reset, all of these devices have already been registered with Fortinet. So I'm going to skip that part regarding the registration. But as far as any configuration that's on these devices, the reset will set them back to their factory defaults. The second thing we had to do is we had to set up the actual IP addressing and the SD-WAN zone. And with the SD-WAN zone, which is an incredible feature on this FortiGate, we can actually control how the traffic is sent out to the internet. We can choose the best link, or we can load balance across the two links, and it's super easy to set up. So before we get into setting up policies and permissions and everything else, we're going to do the initial step of setting up that SD-WAN zone and include the WAN1 and the WAN2 interfaces. And as far as IP addressing goes for the FortiGate, these two interfaces here, we're going to be assigned dynamically an IP address from our service providers. So here in my lab, I've set this up as 23.1.2.0, and the second WAN provider I set up as 24.1.2.0. And so each of these interfaces will get an IP address from those respective ranges here in my lab. Now, for the other interfaces that aren't dynamically assigned on this FortiGate firewall 40, let's have the last octet end in .40. So to manage this device, I'm going to manage it on an interface called internal, 
which you can think of like a logical switch that includes the first five interfaces on the Sporting Gate. And that is on my home network here at 192.168.1.0 with a 24-bit mask. And so as part of the bootstrapping and IP addressing, we'll set up that management interface at 192.168.1.40. And then when we set up VLAN 5 and VLAN 10 and VLAN 20 and the Wi-Fi network, we'll also use the last octet of dot .40 for each of those networks here at the FortiGate. And as we configure the VLANs and the Wi-Fi network, we'll also configure our FortiGate to act as a DHCP server to hand out IP addresses dynamically to both the access points and to devices that connect to these ports in VLAN 10 and 20. All right, so our third step would then go ahead and be to add these switches. So we'll add two Forti switches as part of our Forti switch stack. So by using the port A and B here on this FortiGate, these interfaces by default are assigned to the logical FortiLink interface. And that FortiLink is the connection between our FortiGate and our switches. And then once we have our switches in place, our next step would be to go ahead and create our VLANs. So we'll create VLAN 5 for the benefit of our FortiAPs, and then we'll create VLAN 10 and VLAN 20 for the benefit of users who need to connect to those respective ports. And then once that's done, we'll go ahead and we'll add the access points and we'll create our Wi-Fi network. And then six, if we want any traffic to flow through the FortiGate, whether it's coming in from clients on the wired network or the wireless network, we need to have permissions. And those permissions are getting the form of a firewall policy here on the FortiGate. Also, as part of the permissions, we'll also take care of the network address translation, which by default are included as part of the permission statements in the firewall. The other option is we could do centralized source NAT. In that case, we'd have to do a separate policy just for the NAT. But I'm going to go ahead and use the default where we set up the permissions and the NAT both as part of the firewall policy. And then seven, for fun, let's go ahead and set up some rules regarding SD-WAN to control how the traffic will be forwarded out from the FortiGate to the internet. So I'll label that as SD-WAN rules, which are also going to include an SLA, a service level agreement, where we can monitor and test the paths involved. And then step number eight would be to go ahead and test and verify all of it. And what I'll do in post-production is I'll set this up as chapters so you can actually go to any specific part you want and get the information you need. If you're fairly new or just want to see the overall process from soup to dessert, this is the process that you and I are going to follow. So with that game plan in place, our first step is the factory reset, which is what you and I get to do right now. So to do that, I've remote desktoped into a computer that's sitting behind me, and that computer has a console cable that goes up to the firewall. So we'll open up a terminal session up to that FortiGate. So here we are, and we're going to go ahead and log in. And I'm going to do a factory reset with the command execute factory reset. Press enter, hit Y to continue. So after the reboot, this firewall is going to come back to its factory defaults. And based on our plan, one of the first things we want to do is set that IP address to 192.168.1.40 so we can use it to go ahead and manage that firewall. All right, the reboot is done. So we'll go ahead and log in as admin. There's no password by default. So we'll press enter. We'll set a new password. I'll then confirm the password that I just set and press enter. And the first thing I want to do is set the internal interface from its default at dot .99 to the IP address I want to use for management, which is 192.168.1.40. So we'll type in config sys interface, and then we'll edit internal, which is the name of that logical interface. Let's do a quick show just to verify what's there. And we're going to change this over to 192.168.1.40. So we'll do that with a set IP 192.168.1.40 with a 24-bit mask, press enter. Type in end, and boom, we are done. We should now be able to connect to this device at 192.168.1.40. So let's go ahead and bring up a browser for my management machine, which is also sitting on the same 192.168.1 network, and let's connect over to dot .40. All right, we're using a self-signed certificate for the moment, so we'll go ahead and proceed, and we'll log in as admin with that new password that we just set. I'll click here to begin, and I will change the host name over to FW-40. Based on our plan, click on OK, and then I'll accept the optimal settings for the dashboard. Click on OK. I'll say I don't need to see this video again, and click on OK. And here's the interface for our brand new Firewall 40 with everything set to its factory defaults with the exception of the IP address that we just specified. And here is the version of firmware that we're currently running. Let me also just verify the interfaces here. We'll go to Network on the left, click on Interfaces, and my WAN 1 and WAN 2 are currently connected to my little service provider network. I have here my home office. And so it's been dynamically assigned IP addresses on each of those subnets. And the internal interface has the IP address of .140. And if we wanted to look at the routing table, we could go to the dashboard, go to network, and click here on the routing widget. And we have two default routes through our two service providers with the next hops of .2 on each of those provider networks. So up to this point, we've reset the 48, we set up the management IP address at .40, and now it's time to go ahead and configure the SD-WAN zone.
And so for our SD-WAN zone, we're going to use WAN1 and WAN2 and include them both as members of the SD-WAN zone. So to do that, back at the 40 gate, we'll go to the network section. We'll click here on SD-WAN. And to create a brand new SD-WAN zone, we'll click right here on Create New. From the drop-down, we'll select Zone. And let's call this our SD-WAN zone. And we'll click on OK. So now we have this SD-WAN zone. It's currently red because it has no active members. So let's add two members, WAN1 and WAN2. So we'll click here on Create New once again. But this time from the drop-down, we'll select SD-WAN member. And for the interface, let's get WAN2 first. And we'll add that to the zone we just created called our SD-WAN zone. And because they are both getting their IP address via DHCP, we don't need to specify what the next top is. They learned that via DHCP. And we'll click on OK. Now, the problem is that WAN1 didn't even show as an option. And here's the reason for that. If we go to Network and we go to Interfaces and we go down to WAN1, notice over here in the References column, we have it tied up. If we click on that References link, it'll show us where. So currently, that interface is being used in a firewall policy. So if we select that here and click on Delete, or if we go back to the firewall policy by going to Policy and Objects, Firewall Policy, here's our current firewall policy. If we open this up, currently, it's being referenced right here. So we could go ahead and delete the policy here by right clicking and then from the drop down clicking on delete, that'll work. But now that that interface WAN1 isn't tied up, we can go back to our SD-WAN by going under network, SD-WAN, going down to our SD-WAN zone and we'll go ahead and we'll just edit it. And one other way of adding a new member is simply clicking on the plus here and then saying we want to create a new member. And now we have WAN1 that shows up. So we'll select that, make sure it's in the right zone. And it also is learning about its next top via DHCP. So that's good as is. And we'll click on OK. And then we'll add it and then click on OK. So now we have this SD-WAN zone with two members, WAN1 and WAN2. And before I forget, let's also set up a static default route that says to go ahead and use the SD-WAN zone, which can then leverage either of its members, WAN1 or WAN2. And to do that, we'll go under Network and we'll go to Static Routes. And with Static Route selected, we'll click on Create New. And then we'll go ahead and specify that instead of a next top address, we're going to specify the SD-WAN zone. And as a result, it can then use the next top or the gateway address for either of its members. And we'll click on OK. And then we have a static route that says use any of the members in the SD-WAN zone for routing if you don't have a better, more exact route in the routing table. So on our journey so far, we've reset the firewall. We've set up the IP address on the management interface. We also set up the SD-WAN zone. And now it's time to tackle these switches. So in the background, I've just powered on these switches. The cabling is in place between the firewall and the switch one, and there's also cabling in place between switch one and switch two. So let's once again go back to the interface for the FortiGate and bring those two switches on board. So back here at the FortiGate, I've got a little warning right here. And over here under Wi-Fi and switch controller, I also have a little alert saying, hey, you've got a couple managed forward switches that want to come on board. So what I'll go ahead and do is select both of them together, right click, and then say authorize, which basically says we want to go ahead and be able to manage these switches from the FortiGate acting as the controller for those switches. So we'll go ahead and click on authorize, and then we'll give it just a moment or two for those two devices to go ahead and come online. And the logical connection between the FortiGate and these switches is through the FortiLink interface. And I'm currently using ports A and B, and notice how one is green and one is red. And that is because of this option right here, the FortiLink split interface. It wants to make sure that if we're connecting one port to like switch one and another port to switch two, it wants to make sure that it's not going to inject a loop on itself. So if as part of our FortiLink, we have multiple interfaces that are connecting to the same exact switch, which in our case we do, both those ports go to switch one, we can go ahead and say, you know what, do not use the FortiLink split interface. And that way we can actually do link aggregation and use both ports to forward traffic. So I'm going to go ahead and make that one change. No for link split interface. Click on apply. Then I'm going to go ahead and refresh this page. And when we come back, both of these links should be green. So I'll do a refresh now. And sure enough, now we're using port A and B. So in a Cisco environment, this would be considered a layer two ether channel that's doing 802.1Q trunking. In the world of Fortinet, they simply refer to it as the for link interface, which is performing link aggregation, meaning it's using two or more interfaces for the connectivity on the for link interface. Let's also go back to our managed Forda switches and verify whether or not they've come up. So we've got one that's up. So let me go ahead and right click on that and I'm going to edit it just to give it a more friendly name. And I'm going to call that switch one and click on OK. And the other one, I'm going to right click and edit and I'll call that one switch two. And switch two has an older version of firmware, but it'll still work for our purposes. Also, switch two is a power over Ethernet switch. So I can use it to plug in the access points and not have to use an external transformer for power. So that second switch should be up here in a moment or two. So now, my friend, it is time to create the VLANs that we can use on our switch stack. 
So to create the VLANs, we're going to go under Wi-Fi and Switch Controller. And then down here, we have an option for four to switch VLANs. And let's create our three VLANs based on our plan. So we'll click here on Create New. And we'll call this one VLAN 5. And I'm going to go ahead and put in the title here, VLAN 5 for APs. That way, when I see it, I'll remember what it's for. And it is going to be supporting VLAN number 5. I'm also going to change the color to orange, so it's a little more visible in the interface. And for the IP address, this is the logical interface on the FortiGate regarding VLAN 5. And I want to go ahead and use, based on our plan, 10.5.0.40 with a 24-bit mask. And then I also want to enable DHCP services. So I'll go ahead and enable the DHCP server. And let me start the range at 51 all the way through the end of the range. And also, let me allow clients to connect to this VLAN. Let me allow them to ping the actual firewall interface. And because I'm going to be putting 40 APs on here, I also want to go ahead and allow security fabric connections through this interface. And that way, when the APs come online and want to be managed by the FortiGate, the FortiGate will be willing to go ahead and allow the authorization. All right, so we now created VLAN 5, and we'll click on OK. And let's go ahead and create VLAN 10 for our users and also VLAN 20 for our users. So we'll click here on Create New. We'll call this one VLAN 10. I'm going to go ahead and specify it's VLAN 10, and I'll set the color to blue. And I'll set the IP address for this VLAN interface here on the FortiGate to 10.10.0.40 with a 24-bit mask. I'll allow ping from clients on that VLAN so they can ping their default gateway. And I want to enable DHCP services and I'll start the range at dot 51. And we'll click on OK. All right, so we have VLAN 5 for APs, VLAN 10 for our clients, and let's make VLAN 20 as well. So we'll click on Create New. We'll call this one VLAN 20. And the VLAN it's supporting is VLAN 20. And I'll change the color on that also. And the IP address we want to use on the FortiGate as its logical interface on the VLAN 20 network, that's going to be 10.20.0.40 with a 24-bit mask. And then for clients who connect on this network, we'll allow a ping to this interface address at dot 40, and let's enable DHCP services here as well. And we'll start that range also at dot 51 on the 10.20.0 network, and we'll click on OK. All right, so we've got VLAN 5, VLAN 10, and VLAN 20. Also, while we're right here and talking about creating VLANs, let's also assign some ports on switch 1 and switch 2 to their respective VLANs. My intention is to put two access points into these first two ports on switch 2. So we'll put those two ports into VLAN 5. And then on switch 2, we'll grab a few additional ports and put it in VLAN 20. And over on switch 1, we'll put some ports into VLAN 10. So here at our firewall, acting as a controller for the switch stack, here under Wi-Fi and switch controller, we'll simply go down to four to switch ports. So here are the ports on switch 1. And here are the ports on switch 2. So let's start with switch 1. And let's just go ahead and assign all the ports here, the access ports on switch 1 to VLAN 10. I'm just going to highlight all those, click on the pencil and say, let's put you guys into VLAN 10, click on apply and boom, it is done. Let's go to switch two and switch two. I want these first two ports to be in VLAN five. So we'll highlight those, click on the pencil and say, I want you guys in VLAN five, click on apply. And then I'll put the rest of the ports in VLAN 20. So if you're coming from a Cisco background, the native VLAN is like the VLAN that doesn't get a tag on a trunk. However, in Fortinet, the native VLAN, think of it like the access port. What VLAN do you want a device who's connected to this port to belong to? All right, so let's check our work. So on switch one, we have these ports in VLAN 10. And on switch two, we have these two ports in VLAN 5. We'll put our APs there in a moment. And then the rest of these ports here are on VLAN 20. And if we want to remind ourselves of what the physical connectivity is between the switches and the FortiGate, there's a few ways of doing that. One is to go here to our Manage Forti switches. And then over here on the right, we can use the drop down and select Topology, and that will show us our connectivity. So it goes from the FortiLink over to Switch 1, and then from Switch 1 over to Switch 2. And if we hover over those interfaces, it'll show us the details. So from the FortiGate's perspective, it's using ports A and B as part of the FortiLink interface. And over at switch one, it's physically connecting to port seven and port eight. And then for the connectivity from switch one over to switch two, it's using port nine and 10 respectively on switch one and switch two. All right, our next step is to go ahead and add the access points and to create our Wi-Fi network. So I've got two access points and we're gonna plug them in to ports one and two on switch two, which have already been assigned to VLAN five. This switch is a PoE switch, meaning it can provide power to these access points over these two ports. So give me a moment, I'll go ahead and reset those two access points to their default and I'll plug them in. So I've just plugged those two access points in. I don't see them here yet under Wi-Fi and switch controller, manage 40 AP. So let me just double check a couple things. Let's go down to our 40 switch ports right here. 
and let me collapse switch one. The little blue lightning bolt means that it's currently supplying power and those APs are just booting up. So we'll give that another minute or two for those guys to initialize. And once they do boot up and initialize, we should be able to see them right here under Wi-Fi and switch controller, managed 40 APs. All right, so I did a refresh. I see one of them. So I'll right click on this AP and from the drop down, we'll click on authorize. So it's been a moment and it still shows us waiting for authorization. You know, let me change one thing for the VLAN that those access points are in. So I'm going to go back down to four switch VLANs and let's go into the details for VLAN 5. And I'm going to scroll down. I've already got the security fabric connection enabled. But under DHCP, under advanced, I want to go ahead and modify a couple of things. I want to say, you know what? Use the local FortiGate as your NTP server. And regarding wireless controller, use the same interface IP as the FortiGate. And then for the time zone, I'm going to leave that the same. And now with that change made, I'm going to go ahead and unplug those access points and plug them back in, which effectively is going to power them off. And they're going to repower on, get a new IP to rest with that new information. Also, to err on the side of caution, I also did a reset of those access points. Once again, I just took the little pin tool, hit the reset button, held it down for like 15 seconds, let go. And that should once again reset them to help them forget anything they previously may have known about a configuration. All right, so let's check out our results. Let's go back under Wi-Fi and switch controller, and we'll click here on Managed 40 APs. All right, so there they are. So let me go ahead and grab this first one. I'll right click and we'll say Authorize. So our first one is online and we'll come back and double check on the second one here in just a moment. So while we're waiting for the second access point, let's also create our wireless network. We'll click here on SSIDs under Wi-Fi and switch controller. From the drop down, we'll click on SSID and let's call this our Wi-Fi. And that's the name of this object in the FortiGate acting as the controller for the Wi-Fi network. But we also want the Wi-Fi network to be called the same thing. So under Wi-Fi settings for SSID, we'll also here call it our underscore Wi-Fi. All right, so that's the actual SSID, the wireless name that'll show up. And based on our plan, we want this Wi-Fi network to have the IP address space of 10.30. So let's go ahead and make that the IP address for the logical interface on the controller for this brand new Wi-Fi network. So we'll put in the IP address of 10.30.0.40 with a 24-bit mask. And let's enable ping for clients who connect on the network. They can ping their default gateway. And let's also enable DHCP services on that wireless network, starting at 10.30.0.51, all the way through the end of the range. And as we scroll down, so here under security mode, let's go ahead and use WPA2 personal, and I'll put in a passphrase, and we'll click on OK. All right, so there's our Wi-Fi network. So this first one that's online, that is connected to port 2, so I'm going to go ahead and name that. I'm going to call it AP2, and click on OK. And when I did the reset, I may not have hit the reset for a full 10 seconds to reset it. So I'm going to go back to the one that's hanging off of port one, and I'm going to do a reset once again, just to give it a nice fresh start. All right, I just gave it a nice fresh restart. I'm also going to right click here and delete it. So it is currently rebooting. And when it comes back, we'll go ahead and authorize it and we should be good to go. So in the meantime, we have one access point that's supporting our wireless networks. And we have this wireless network called our Wi-Fi. And also as a quick test, we should verify that that Wi-Fi network is visible over the airwaves. So this is a little tool called NetSpot. So I'm going to do a filter for our Wi-Fi. And sure enough, I've got that Wi-Fi network showing up in the 5 gigahertz range and also the 2.4 gigahertz range from that one access point that is currently online. And while that second access point is coming up, let's go ahead and tackle our next piece. And that is permissions, because clients in VLAN 10 or 20 or clients on the Wi-Fi network they're not going anywhere through the firewall unless we set up permissions. So to configure the permissions, we're going to go back to the FortiGate and we're going to set up a firewall policy to allow the traffic through the firewall. So back here at the FortiGate, we're going to go under policy and objects and go to firewall policy and create a new firewall policy to allow the traffic to go through the firewall. So we'll click here on create new and let's call this first rule VLAN 10 to internet. And that'd be for traffic that is coming into the firewall on the VLAN 10 interface and going out of the firewall through the SD-WAN zone. So we'll select the egress interface as the SD-WAN zone. And for the source IP address, it'll be coming from the 10.10 .10 address space. So we'll choose that address object that was created when we set up that VLAN interface on the FortiGate. And regarding the destination IP address, it could be anywhere on the internet. So I'm gonna say all because the internet's a big place. And then as far as the service, we'll allow them to use any protocols they want. And then we'll allow that with the accept. And I'm also going to go ahead and enable logging for everything because this is the default configuration. I'm also going to go ahead and allow the default configuration for network address translation using the outbound IP address on the egress interface, whether it's WAN 1 or WAN 2. So whatever the IP address is on the egress or outbound interface, 
that's the IP address that's going to be used for the address translation. So we'll click on OK, and then we'll do that similar treatment for VLAN 20. So we'll click on Create New. We'll call this VLAN 20 to Internet. And the incoming interface there would be traffic coming in on the VLAN 20 interface on the FortiGate and going out of the SD-WAN zone. And for the IP addressing, the source would be the VLAN 20 address space. So we'll choose that from the list with this VLAN 20 address object. And the destination would be anywhere on the internet as far as IP addresses are concerned. And any service is going to be allowed, so we'll allow all services. And then once again, we'll leave the defaults for address translation. I also want to do logging, which is really convenient in the lab for troubleshooting. And we'll click on OK. And then last but not least, let's also allow traffic outbound for traffic coming in to the network via the Wi-Fi network that also wants to go out to the internet. So we'll click here on Create New to create a new policy to allow Wi-Fi traffic. And we'll call this Wi-Fi to internet. So for the incoming interface to be traffic coming into the network via our Wi-Fi, that's the Wi-Fi network that we created a few moments ago. And the outgoing interface would be our SD-WAN zone, which includes the two member interfaces, WAN 1 and WAN 2. And for the source IP addressing, it'd be IP addresses associated with our Wi-Fi network, which is the 10.30.0 address space. So we'll select that. And the destination could be anywhere, once again, because the internet's a big place. And we'll select all there. And then for the service, we'll also permit any service. And the default action is allow or accept. And let's also go ahead and use the defaults for NAT. And we'll also go ahead and log everything. So we'll click on OK. Also, for troubleshooting, the implicit deny here is currently not logging. I'm going to edit that. I'm going to say, please go ahead and log all the traffic that's been denied from the implicit deny rule so we can troubleshoot that as well if we need to. And we are now good to go. So if we go back to Wi-Fi and switch controller and manage 40 APs, and let me right click and authorize. I'll go ahead and right click on it and edit the name. Let's call that AP1 and click on OK. And there we go. AP1 is now online and ready to go. So if we look at our tasks here for getting this gear up and running from a factory default state, we are now right here with our SD-WAN rules where we can control how that traffic is going to be forwarded from our clients who are wired in or coming in via wireless as that traffic is being forwarded out to the internet. Let's go ahead and let's set up, first of all, a performance SLA that's monitoring the jitter and latency and packet loss going through service provider A and service provider B. And let's set up some targets for that SLA, let's say 150 milliseconds for latency and 50 milliseconds for jitter. And for packet loss, let's go ahead and say zero as far as a percentage. And then with that SLA in place, let's go ahead and configure the FortiGate to consider the latency on both those links. And let's have it choose the best option. And that way, whichever has a better latency by at least 10%, it'll go ahead and use that path. So to configure the SD-WAN stuff, let's go up to Network and click on SD-WAN. And let's start off by creating a performance SLA. So currently, if we look at our SD-WAN zone members, most of the traffic is being forwarded through WAN 1. And when I say most traffic, there isn't very much because we don't have any clients sending traffic at the moment. So let's go up to Performance SLAs tab, and let me go ahead and take all the default SLAs that we have here, delete them, and let's start from scratch by creating our own. So we'll click here on Create New, and let's call this Measure Both Paths out to the internet, meaning the path through WAN 1 and Service Provider A and the path through WAN 2 and Service Provider B. And we'll do active probes, we'll use pings, and let's target a DNS server from Google. Let's also use a second server, and that way, if we have a server failure out there on the internet, our WAN link won't think it's dead because of a remote server that's not responding. So we'll put two servers in there, and we'll specify which members we want to participate. I only have two, so I'm going to manually select both of them to participate as part of the probes. And let's also set up an SLA target with what we planned on, 150 milliseconds for latency, 50 milliseconds for jitter, and zero packet loss. And we'll send out those probes every 500 milliseconds, which is two times per second. And if there's five consecutive probe failures where there's no response back, we'll just consider that link inactive. And later, if we get five probes that are in consecutive order that do come back, we'll bring that link back up as active. And for an interface where we lose the probes, we'll also remove any static routes associated with that egress interface. So that is our performance SLA. We'll click on OK. And in a few moments, it'll give us details regarding packet loss and latency and jitter regarding those two paths. Meanwhile, let's set up a new SD-WAN rule to control how the traffic will be forwarded. So we'll click on the SD-WAN rules tab and click on create new. And let's call this SD-WAN rule use best link. Then we can lock it down for the conditions of this rule. So for source, I'm going to leave that open. For the destination, I'm going to say anywhere, for example, anywhere on the internet and any protocol and any service. And then for the outgoing interface, I'm going to go ahead and choose 
best quality. And to determine which is the best quality, I'm going to go ahead and use latency. And for the interface preference, I want to go ahead and use WAN 1 and WAN 2. Now, we also could just go ahead and put the zone preference of the zone by itself without an interface. But if we have the interfaces listed and if the latency is within 10% of each other, it's going to use the listed order here as preference for which interface it's going to use to forward traffic. So we've told it to pay attention to latency. We also need to tell it which SLA to consider. So we'll go ahead and put that target measure both paths. Let me go ahead and save this. And let's go back to performance SLAs. Everything looks in the green down here. Regarding packet loss, they both have zero latency. They both have very low latency. And both paths also have very low jitter. So if we go back to our SD-WAN rules now, this rule called use best link, there's a little check mark next to WAN1, which means it's the preferred interface that it's going to use. And so if the latency is within 10% of each other, it's going to use the order of the interfaces as they are appearing in the rule. And that's why the check mark is on WAN1. We can also verify latency, jitter, and delay at the interface. This is a SSH session over to our firewall. We can do a diagnose, sys, SD-WAN, health check, press enter, and that will also show us the details. So here's our packet loss, latency, and jitter for both interfaces, WAN1 and WAN2. So now that we've done all these steps, one through seven, it's now time to go ahead and test it. So I have remote desktop to a client over the ethernet network, and this client has a wireless network card, but it's currently not connected to a wireless network. So I'll right click on the Wi-Fi connection here, and I'll click on connect. And over here on the right, we'll go ahead and connect to our Wi-Fi. And I'm gonna click on connect, and I'll supply the credentials. And we are connected. So let's go ahead and do a couple things. Let's first of all verify that we can get out to the internet. So I'll bring up a command prompt and let's go ahead and do a ping to 8888. And that is working, fantastic. Let's also do a trace route here on this Windows computer. And I'm gonna say don't bother doing name resolution for the reverse lookups. And also I'm just really concerned about the first couple of hops. So let's do a trace route, dash D for no name resolution and dash H for two hops. And let's go ahead and go out to 8888. So our first hop is the default gateway, which is the Wi-Fi interface on the FortiGate, gate. And the next hop is my service provider over the WAN 1 connection at 23.1.2.2. So if we go back to our SD-WAN rules, it's showing us that it prefers the WAN 1 connection. And that's very likely because if we look at the latency here on WAN 1, it's 14.38 milliseconds. And WAN 2 is 13.87. So close. It's not 10% apart. So here's what I propose we do. Let's go ahead and manipulate the actual latency involved with that path through WAN 1. And as a result, WAN 2 should start being used to forward traffic. And that's on the 24.1.2 network. So I'm going to go back to EVNG. And this is our ISPA path right here that's currently being used. I'm going to right click on that path. Click here from the drop down and edit quality. And I'm going to add 100 milliseconds of delay by clicking on apply and then clicking on save. Now we could verify that a couple of ways. We could verify it at the command line. So here at the command line, we can use the command diagnose, sys, sd-wan, health check, press enter. And sure enough, the latency is now about 100 more than it was on WAN 1. So in the background, what should be happening is the best path should now be chosen as WAN 2 because WAN 2 is more than 10% better than WAN 1 because of the artificially injected delay that we just put in there. And if we click here on performance SLAs, we can also see here that WAN1 here in yellow is now about 114 milliseconds. It's also showing up right here, also in the output. So if we brought back our client and we did that trace again, the traffic should now be forwarded out WAN2 because it's the best path based on latency compared to path one. So here at our client, we'll hit the up arrow key, press enter. And the first hop is our default gateway at 10.30.0.40. That's the 40 gate. And then the second hop is our service provider going through our WAN2 interface. And here back at the 48, if we went back to our SD-WAN rules, check it out. WAN 2 has the little check mark next to it because its latency, which is around 14 milliseconds, is way better than WAN 1, which is over 114. And it only needs to be 10% better by default to be considered the best interface. And if we want to see the sessions that are going through the 48, we can go to Dashboard, and there's several Forty View options here by default. We can add or remove them if you want as well. And here under Wi-Fi and Switch Controller, if we click here on Wi-Fi Clients, it can give us details here as well. So here's the client's IP address. There's this MAC address. It's coming in via AP-2. There's details about the 2.4 gig and the 5 gigahertz radios inside of AP-2. And the client's coming in through the SSAD called our Wi-Fi. And if we want more information, we could go ahead and select that client and then click here on Diagnostics and Tools. And this gives us even more information about that client that's connected, including the channel they're connecting on and information about signal strength. 
And if we click on destinations, it's showing us information about where that client is connected. And if we open up a browser on that computer, and let's say we go to YouTube, and let's open up another tab, let's go to Fortinet.com. Now, if we go back and look at the details for that client under diagnostics and tools and go to destinations, it should now reflect all that activity as well. Including if we click over here on performance, it's also showing us the signal strength and noise and bandwidth for that individual client, which is pretty darn cool. And if we want to see which policies that that client is matching as it goes up to the internet, we can click here on policies to help confirm which policy it's hitting. So this is the policy from our firewall that's permitting the initial flow of traffic. So thanks for joining me in this journey as we started with defaulted configurations for the FortiGate, the firewall, the FortiSwitches, and the FortiAPs, and we built a functional network with internet connectivity, including the use of SD-WAN at the local FortiGate. And if you're fascinated by Fortinet products, which I happen to be, and you want more information on them, we have lots of great training over at CBT Nuggets, including content regarding NSC Level 4, Level 5, Level 6, and NSC Level 7. Once again, thanks for joining me, and I'll see you in another set of videos very, very soon.